All right, looks like we're ready to roll. Welcome everybody to episode nine of Shift Happens. Um, we've had one of these episodes where we just kind of called an audible and and it's didn't have any any pre-designed content for the course. I think that was maybe a week or so ago. Um, I wanted to do that again today. I mean, there's we've talked about a lot. We've talked about some pretty advanced things. Um, this is kind of another, it's Monday morning, let's just take a breath. One of the things I'm most interested in is what what can I do for you guys? One of the things I'm noticing is a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about, both on these calls and in other conversations, it's hard for a lot of people to grasp or even even take as credible because it's it's not hitting the news cycle for a week or two. Um, you guys might have seen in our Facebook group this morning, I posted a, a link from Forbes. There's also been, I probably saw half a dozen articles this morning on, you know, this surprise that's happening in the mortgage market. Well, if you, if you don't remember, we talked about that on April 1st. Uh, we had a, a Shift Happens episode just like kind of an emergency episode because of what we were seeing there. So um, Kat is going to drop in the chat panel and in, in the Zoom webinar chat. She's going to drop um, a link to a survey that will really help help me understand what direction to take this. Um, when we first started, I told you guys I would be, you know, I would be looking for direction once we got through what I know I want you to to be how what how I the information I want you to have to be prepared. And when I kind of run out of that, I'm, I'm going to look to you guys to tell me what you need the most. So, you know, you're our audience. You're the ones that take value from this. Um, rather than me continuing to talk about things that, that might not be what you, you know, the, the most important thing you want to hear about right now, give us some feedback. Let's get interactive with this. So that's kind of what I want to do today. I want to, I want to just, you know, freestyle this more like a, one, of, one of our mastermind calls. And you guys, you have me for an hour or however long we, we go. Um, how can I help you? Uh, we've talked about what's coming, you know, like, like what market trends will look like. Uh, we've talked about lending. We've talked about SBA programs, um, a lot of different things. So uh, of all that, like what, what can I do to help you guys today? So we're just going to go straight to uh, the questions. And let me see if we have any right now. We've got one in Q&A. Uh, thanks a lot, Steve Carney. Um, all right, so we have nothing right now. If uh, if nobody has any questions, I'll go get my guitar, and and that that's will punish all of you. But uh, we've got fifty folks on here. Somebody probably has something they need they need help with. Uh, I've been helping a lot of people put deals together, save deals. Um, is there anything that that we can help with? And what do you what would you like to see in the future as far as pre designed? Like if you could take if you can get a two hour class on anything, what is that right now? Like, how can I show you? How, what can I help you with? Um, Bill, let me unmute you here. Bill Gross, you are able to talk on your side, sir. Hey, Chad, how you doing? I'm well, how are you today? Good, I started writing out a question and then you said a two hour class. So my, my question is not exactly a two hour class. Um, but I do, I do think you have a unique stage of coordinating people across the country. Um, and so I, I just had a question that I thought I'd throw out to you. Um, um, you know, I've been working as a result of, uh, um, you know, really your training and, um, you know, being involved with this for a year and a half now. I go to court every day and I, I, I you know, look to list property. I look to bring in investors to buy at court over bids. I'm in LA. LA was shut down uh, March 17th. It says it's reopening. I should say the, the closure expires April 17th, though I suspect they're going to um, they're going to delay again the court confirmation of sale hearings. They've been they've been delaying almost all hearings other than emergency hearings. Um, but I'm wondering what's happening nationally. Are any courts still holding court confirmation of sale hearings? Are any courts reopened and maybe doing them remotely in any way. LA says they won't do Zoom calls or anything like that. So I was just trying to get an idea of that particular niche, the court confirmation of sale hearings. Is everybody shut down? Are any courts doing it virtually? Or have any courts opened up since that's such a big part of my business today? Right. And I actually looked at that last Monday. I wanted to, 
uh, when I was looking at what do we do for the week, that's one of the things I thought, man, what if I could actually tell people what we see across the country? And I cannot find any kind of single aggregate resource for county courts. Um, there, are, there is some good information out on, on U.S. district courts, and they've basically issued continuances on everything. Um, and, and a lot of them are through, you know, into mid-June. Um, I have not been able to efficiently find, I mean, we have 3,149 counties. And even with researchers and record rooms, you know, I, not to be mean here, but they're not exactly, you know, they're not paralegals, um, a lot of, most of them. So they're, they, they know how to do what they do. Um, they're not court experts, right? They don't fully understand it all. So we have, I mean, we only have a, a couple of dozen counties that have shut down on the record side. Even when courts are like, I have called around here in Virginia, everything's pretty much business as normal, but we only have uh, in the entire, in my entire county, Roanoke County, we have 45,000 people. We only have 14 cases of, of coronavirus. So it's not that bad here. And then but there's other areas like Jersey, um, New York, you know, Pennsylvania, they're hit extremely hard. And I think they've just kind of suspended everything. So I, I, I don't have a, a good resource now, even for, you know, for my own, for my, my own knowledge, I don't have a good way to get a read on it. Um, I'm happy to hear if anyone else on this call has, you know, if you know what's happening in, in your market, um, please let us know. Let us know what you're seeing in your courthouses. Um, I did call the clerk here and everything's, you know, they're doing e-recordings. Attorneys and paralegals have full court access. Um, they are using remote court. I think one of the things you'll see, and we did talk about this, I think you'll the only way to clear the judicial backlog we've created, but a lot of people haven't yet realized, I think they're going to have to open back up physical courtrooms but they're also going to have to to pivot and run parallel uh, a digital courtroom. I think that's the only way we're going to clear the the backlog of, because I mean, divorces are spiking, bankruptcies are spiking, foreclosures will go to the moon whenever they lift moratoriums, evictions will go to the moon when they lift moratoriums, and then you have everything else that happens in a normal case, you know, in, in normal court. So they, they, you know, like my state here in Virginia and North Carolina, I know did this too. It may, it's probably more widespread than that, than I'm aware, but they're actually not even enforcing property crime. Like they're, they're only basically looking for violent crime enforcement mm -hmm. and they're, and they accelerated parole for anyone who was up eligible for parole. They accelerated that. So they know, like, I think our, our leadership sees that we're going to have a big problem in courts. Um, so they're making some moves to try to lighten that log jam when it, when we do try to break it. But so anyway, that's, that's a whole lot of talking for, to not answer your question. I, I think, you know, depending on how the federal government reacts, I think they're hinting around just because this is wearing so hard on people. I think they're trying to give us encouraging news, but I, I don't think, I hope that they don't, open the country too soon, open everything back up and, and cause a second wave of this because we've already sacrificed too much. We need to stay the course. But I, I think that, you know, it, it's certainly not getting better right now. Um, there's some encouraging news, but I think we're, we're still on, the, I think we're still on the rise in most areas. Um, so it, it could cause major delays. We, it could be July or August before we actually see those happen. One of the things I would encourage you to do, Bill, is if you haven't, if you're not doing this, you know, just try to nudge everybody. Well, of course, I guess without that, if they didn't have full authority coming into it, they may not be able to get it now. I'm not, a, I'm not sure if they've already had their confirmation. They have their article, their, their letters. Can they go to, is the clerk working and can they get hurt? Can they get uh, some sort of exception on full authority? So one thing that, um, you know, a couple of things just to share. I think that, um, you know, a lot of agents and investors hesitate to go to court. Obviously, logistically, going to court takes time. But in this area, since nobody, there is no court to go to, I think the, the um, opportunity for being an expert is better than ever. And that would mean, like for me, I'm a member of the local bar association and, and paying real close attention to their communication. Uh, and, and their video programs. Um, I'll give you an example that um, one, of, one of the people in our group, I forget who, somebody from Vegas, from Clark County, Vegas, Nevada, um, shared that there they were um, 
requiring for court overbids a uh, investor to file with the court three days ahead of time their intent to overbid. Oh, and yeah, I then, saw uh, one of our subscribers, Steve Hoops, put that up. Is there that you go. You, there yeah. you go. And, and so then uh, I, was, I was talking to an attorney who happens to be on our bar association's trust uh, and estates department. She's the head of it. And, and we're talking about, because we have a case that's, that's being delayed. And I shared with her that procedure. And she said, that's fantastic. And I, I went online and got the info and sent that to her. So she's proposing it to our, our j head judge here in the probate division. Well, that's, what's that worth being able to have that kind of a level of conversation with, with an attorney? There's no other realtor is able to do that that aren't really involved with your group at a deep level. So I, I guess my, my, more than that question, I guess I was just kind of throwing out that that data, that information is gold. And, and so anybody who has information on best practices, changes being made, changes in schedules, courts opening, courts going virtual, uh, as that information is shared, we all have the benefit, the opportunity to benefit from it and share it with our, our local attorneys, you know, to say, oh, well, maybe we're not open in LA yet, but for example, Boston's reopened or Boston is all virtual now. That information is really valuable. So I was just more, I think, reaching out to say, let's try to use your program as a clearinghouse for that, those kind of uh, data points. Yeah, so well, I, I, that's a great idea. And I want to I want to have something actionable there. So let's say this, guys. I, I agree with you, Bill. Let's start a, a conversation in Facebook in our All the Leads Mastermind group. Uh, if you're not a member, be sure to jump over and request access. But let's start a thread on that. And I mean, I think that's that's where we a lot of us have our attention already. So I think that's the right uh, the right forum for this. Um, let's start talking and the, the, at the individual level, like what you can do, your action item, you know, I would suggest call, call your courthouse, get a read in your market. Um, there's no way that I can possibly do, you know, do this and bring all this back to you. So I'm asking for your help. I'm deputizing you, um, you know, get in touch with your court, you find out, you know, what, what's happening on, on the probate court side of things, learn what you can. It's a great opportunity for you to step out of your comfort zone, get to know those people. And, um, and then bring it back to the group, kind of post it and say, here's what's happening in my market. Um, if you have a probate website, something that, that uh, would be very helpful is go to your homepage and, and add in like a, you know, COVID-19 up-to-date information or something like that above the fold where anyone who visits your, your probate website can actually see that. And go back and, and, you know, I'm not, if, if you don't know how to do WordPress and do your own updates, this might not work, but it's not that hard, not, not that difficult to learn, but just go in and, and create a timeline or start a blog post series. Like you have a blog component because it is a WordPress site. You can do a, you know, COVID-19 response as a blog category um, and then courts as a tag. But like convey that information in your market to get the credibility bills talking about and then share those. If, if you do a blog post every Monday, like block this in your calendar. So every Monday I call the court, I figure out what happens. I publish that evening or Monday at 2 PM. I publish the blog post. I come back to the Facebook group and share that post. So then we can start to see across the country, like what you guys are seeing, you're providing value back to this group where you're, you're getting value and you're providing it to your own, to, you know, to the, the people in your market. It's a link you can use to send to attorneys like, Hey, by the way, I talked to the clerk this morning in case you haven't had time, check out this blog post. So you can send that to all your probate attorneys, uh, family law attorneys, anyone that's, that's associated in this. So anyways, those are some actionable ideas that I had while you're talking, Bill. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, Barry, you're up next, sir. Barry, you're allowed to join us if you'd like to. Um, Barry says, how can we prepare prospects for the likelihood that property preparations will be slowed down by the pandemic? What can we suggest to them to best use the time? Um, Barry, do you have a microphone? Looks like you're still muted on your side. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, as far as property preparations, are we talking about a probate listing? It looks like you got remuted, Barry. Let me see if I can unmute you. 
Okay. How about now? Can you hear me? Yes, I got you now. Okay. Um, as okay. far as property preparations, you mean preparing a probate for market or more general listings? A part of the uh, discussion with prospects uh, for turning them into clients, you know, what, what suggestions can we make? Just informing them of what we do and how they can best make use of the time, assuming I can't even get people out to help them clear out the property, for okay. example. And so I'm asking, are you isolating this conversation to your probate campaign? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Assuming nobody can get out there to help them, I would at least want them to have a, a like one, one of the, some of the thing, and let's just, let's make some assumptions. They're physically incapable of moving furniture and like managing one-off sales and things like that. So they've, they've got a lot of challenges, right? What if they go over to the house with the, like, they can go to any store and get those little green stickers, like yard sale price stickers. And let's choose three colors. Um, keep in the family, sell, donate, trash. Let's do four colors. So you could have green means it goes to sale. Yellow means donate. Red means trash and blue means it stays in the family. So they can go create an inventory list of all, all the personal property. <clears throat> they can put those little stickers on it. Um, if someone in the family is physically capable of staging the sale stuff in a garage or somewhere to make it more convenient for the estate sale company, um, if Habitat for Humanity and uh, Restore and um, Goodwill, uh, you know, if they are still making donation runs, I'm actually not sure if they are, but a lot of things are listed as essential services. So they can handle the donation part of it. Um, go ahead and, and, you know, you can go ahead and get the property listed with a future list date um, and or get it under contract. So there's a lot of things we can do, even though if we can't actually move forward into selling the real estate, we can do everything to prepare it. We can be, you know, mulching flower, like we can do the curb appeal stuff. So in mastery, I always suggest have a list of 10 things you can do for less than $5,000, like a punch work list for every probate house. So power washing, sealing driveways, painting doors, painting shutters, just increasing curb appeal is going to result in a faster sale, which is going to be very important for them in a falling market. Um, and what we're seeing now, you know, the market is basically heading into that frozen stage that I warned about, <clears throat> but prices haven't fallen. But you know, with lenders making a move to, you know, what I expected to happen, the lending, lending guidelines are tightening and it's going to knock probably a quarter of your buyers either out of the market or knock them down in their price range to something they can qualify for. Um, if other lenders go the way Chase has gone, Chase basically t went back to a traditional American, like, you know, uh, uh, industrial revolution lending. So, 20% down, 700 credit score or higher, low debt, let, low debt to income thresholds. So if that happens, you want to have the house looking as good as possible and you want to be able to get it on the market as fast as possible because the delay will cost you money. So you can use that to motivate your people to do things like this. Like anything we can do right now that will get us on the market faster needs to be done because I'm going to tell you, we are going to catch a falling knife and a lot of sellers, I would recommend they just sit this period out, but you're in probate. You need to get this done. I understand, but it's important that we price aggressively and the home shows as best it possibly can um, because there are still buyers out there that are extremely motivated to get there, to get something before lending guidelines tighten even more and they're locked out of the market. Um, and, you know, they don't know, like if they're not technically unemployed now, but they know they might be in 60 days, but they can afford this house even if even on unemployment. So that's the kind of buyers we, we want to be part of the marketplace before those guys go away. And, you know, because they bought something else or they do, you know, or they, they are no longer eligible as a buyer. So those are some of my ideas, just like anything you can do, no matter how small it is, anything you can do to speed up your time to market uh, when you can get this thing out there is, is going to be, it, it's you know it's worth every every minute of their time great thanks good question um uh john O. yeah let's find you here john john O. you are allowed to talk if you would like to unmute good morning child i was awakened uh, pretty good. How about yours? 
Yeah, not too bad. Um, I'm trying to see the best way to get the highest on uh, ELAC out right now. Um, my DTI is high and Bank of America already denied me. So I'm wondering, should it be community bank or credit union? Is this on your primary residence? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, credit unions are great for those. It's usually prime plus one and a quarter with six months of deferred interest a lot of, to a lot of times. Okay. Um, so I would, I would start with a, a credit union. Do you, do you have deposit accounts with any community banks or credit unions? I used to have one, but I closed it. So I might revisit that one. Yeah. Where is your money on deposit in one bank or across several? Several. Yes. I, w it, I mean, my suggestion would be pull, pull some of your big bank accounts, pull that cash back and put it, put it into community banks and credit unions. <laughs> and create a real relationship with them because they get 10 to one leverage. You give them a thousand bucks, they can loan 10,000. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, like when I first moved to Roanoke, I took, uh, I think I put 10,000 in each bank that I wanted to take me seriously. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that, it, you know, it's not a requirement. That's just enough that it, it's, you know, it, it, it gets their attention. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I would recommend go to the, the credit unions. What market are you in? Where are you? DMV, Maryland. <laughs> oh yeah. So you have first citizens bank. Um, first citizens is a regional bank that act, still acts like a community bank. And I, I love them actually. Mm -hmm. And with them, I did a HELOC. Uh, it's prime plus one and a quarter, no closing costs. Mm -hmm. uh, they do a, a desktop appraisal. Mm -hmm. So it was done end to end and probably four business days. Mm -hmm. And with it, what is you, do you have a high credit score, like above seven? Yes. Or? Yes. Uh, I think it was above 780. Um, if you're above 780, you can get a 90 LTV. So I, I was able to push push my LTV up to, up to 90%. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's just important that you know that money is only for investment purposes. Mm -hmm. And it's only for pretty much home run investment purposes or like really solid base hit, nothing mm -hmm. speculative. Mm -hmm. um, just that was more for everybody else. Like, I think you're, you're looking to do, you were on our other session, like what we're discussing guys, you can access the equity in your home right now while banks are still allowing, allowing that. And there's still liquidity as things get, as, as this settles in and, and, you know, right now the, the, the we need to finish what we, what they announced last Friday, but eh, politicians are on vacation this week. So while we're sitting here in these uncertain times, it's a good time to be gathering up whatever cash you can from the banks. And one of the suggestions I had made in previous sessions was access your lines of credit. So get a home equity line of credit established. So John, I, I would look for first citizens bank. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you, you might potentially even split, like take money from B of A and split it across a credit union mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, uh, the community and first citizens credit mm -hmm. unions are great. Like, especially if you use, I don't use car loans or auto loans or anything, but they are super competitive. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that credit unions by nature are just more people oriented because they're nonprofits and they're, mm -hmm. you know, they, they're there to serve the community. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's, that would be my suggestions. Uh, first citizens is extremely efficient and inexpensive. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, they're really good loans. And it's tied right into their online banking. Like you can literally just log in just like it's your checking account and do everything. Okay. Thanks a lot, Chad. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, John. All right. Next up, we have Anonymous. That's a good question, Anonymous. Um, so Anonymous said, hello, hello all. I'm wondering what people are adding to their scripts at this time. If you're on this call, you better not be using a script. Um, how can I continue to call leads without coming off inconsiderate? So this is one of the things that we addressed in our, um, our monthly role play calls. So for the April role play that we just did this past Wednesday, Kat, can you please drop a link in, uh, in the notes? for anonymous. Uh, I'm, we won't cover it here. You've got an hour of that. So we've, you know, we've, we've all had to pivot um, and the language has changed. Um, but we shared a lot of ideas on there that, about, you know, what, what can be said. So be sure and listen to last the April role play call. Kat will drop you a link in the, in the chat notes. 
Jim Forsyth, coming for you. Jimmers, you are unmuted on my side. All right. How about now? Can you hear me? I got you. Yeah. Do you get my question? Oh, you didn't get blown away by a tornado last night. That's good. No, they were uh, south down Louisiana and Mississippi and Georgia. South of them. Yeah. This time. We had some last week. So, what do I think – um, how, how is how is the pandemic going to affect our probate leads? Do you think they're going to be looking to sell quicker than the past? Also discuss where you think real estate values are going in the next three to six months. Okay. Um, again, I will preface this with I'm thinking further ahead. Um, when I talk about this, I'm, I'm looking at all the, the underlying economic indicators that I see in the broader economy. I know there's a lot of a lot of optimism in real estate that I think is going to end up getting a lot of people blindsided in 60 to 90 days when they have no revenue. Um, for me, I think we're going to come out of this with a high sentiment. I think buyers agents, for the most part, are extremely optimistic and they're going to be trying to close every buyer they possibly can. So uh, let me break this into a 30-day, let's say 30-day, 90-day, and and then beyond that. For the next 30 days. You need to have as many listings as you can, and you need, to, you need to have virtual tours. You need to have quirky, funny sign writers. You need to have really interesting copy, things that really make the house stand out and people will share while they're sitting at home. And I mean, get goofy. The less professional you are, the more fun you are, the more human you are, the more likely these things are to get exposure. If, you, if, if your listing description will make a buyer laugh and make a realtor laugh, then you've done what I've suggested. Do funny things like this to really set your listings apart, get them attention. If you don't have a 360 cam, go get one, go borrow one, send it to your seller, get them to do a virtual tour. I don't care how bad it is. If you don't have virtual tours on 100% of your listings, do that. Because when we do open back up, it's important that you get the most amount of exposure quickly so you can take advantage of those buyers who, ha who still do qualify for mortgages. In my, in, in my longer outlook, over a 90-day period, what I believe is going to happen is when we bring the real economy back online, the real unemployment numbers will probably remain in low double digits, and you'll start to see just how many small businesses aren't going to come out of this. Some of this could change based on what the Federal Reserve announced on Friday, if that, if that extremely, extremely low debt um, can actually help. But my, my, my concern is the Federal Reserve's offering debt just like they are, just like the United States. So where debt is debt, it's still on your balance sheet. So for a lot of companies who are already strangled, if you put more debt on their balance sheet, how the hell is that going to help them anyways? Um, what it may end up happening, what I'm, what I'm saying could really change my outlook on this is that the Federal Reserve issues that $2.3 trillion dollars and then they forgive it so it's no longer on the balance sheets of these companies, then I think you'll have a much, much different outcome. And we will have one hell of a credit bubble that will pop at some point, probably in our lifetimes. And at that point, I'm thinking we're, we're rebalancing currencies. Um, but now I think this is a kick the can move for sure. I think you're going to have a robust and roaring recovery, but I don't think it's going to come – as quickly as what the optimists are saying. Um, there's, there's just when we take the production side of our economy offline for this long, we don't, we don't have a blueprint for this. I don't think it's going to be like flipping a switch. I think it's going to be a slow climb back into normalcy. I think that consumer, consumer behaviors and, and people, people are going to be on guard. People aren't going to travel as much. People aren't going to especially the older community, you know, elderly community, they're not going to be as willing to just go out in the public. Um, this is a very emotional thing and the psychology of it is, is going to have lasting impact. And we're going to have to figure out what that new economy looks like. So over time, I think you're going to have a, a really quick spike of business and that's a great time to offload listings you have. Then I think the reality will set in. I think the market will freeze for a period and the really motivated sellers like divorces are spiking, bankruptcies are spiking, foreclosures haven't, but they, they will. Like when forbearances left, you'll see a big surge in that. 
we'll have a log jam of distressed assets that'll create some delays in clearing the market. And we're going to have buy, te very timid buyers and sellers, which will allow, which will, means prices will start to settle out, settle down, um, not in a good way. And we'll start to see some correction in price until we find the motivated parties who are willing to take the risk at that price or until that price gets low enough, the people who didn't qualify for financing all of a sudden now do. Um, in top 25 MSAs where, where things have been super, super heated and, and it's, they're very emotion and lifestyle driven markets that their people aren't buying on logic. Um, you know, look at places like uh, Seattle, San Francisco, I mean, hell, Cal the West Coast in general, anywhere where people were spending, you know, where you have multiple offers, people paying 20, 30% over list price. I think in those markets, you're going to see some, some sharp corrections and your average markets where, where real estate, where the, the activity has been based on real economics, like local employment and, and incomes. I think those will be a little more stable, but they'll have a stalled period. Long term, I think that when the distressed assets start rolling through, that's obviously going to put downward pressure on, on, on the existing inventory, a lot like what you saw in 2011. Um, we have much stronger market fundamentals than, than we did in, two, or excuse me, 2001 is what I meant to say, um, where people, like, they're just, they're, they're not sure about where we're going as a country in this new economy. They've watched too much news, and they're just not sure if buying a house is the right thing to do. Um, and then eventually when, when those foreclosures start to come through because we're using, you know, comparable sales, that will start to drag markets down, especially in, in the hardest hit parts of the economy, like where the unemployment is worse. Um, and then we'll see real recovery beyond that. And I'm guessing that's probably somewhere around first quarter 2021 is where a lot of this, a lot of the government intervention will have worked its way through. <clears throat> and we can actually see real recovery and that's where inflation will absolutely eat you alive if you don't invest in hard assets. So if you're sitting in cash beyond first quarter of 2021, and this is how I'm assessing my own strategy, guys, I'm, I'm, I may be wrong and, and I might get blistered in, in comments, whatever, how about it? This is what I'm doing to protect my assets. But I think the real buying opportunities, if you're looking to buy are probably probably first quarter 2021. Um, potentially it could be earlier than that. It just depends on how, how we handle forbearances and what court backlogs look like. Um, there's a lot of ifs, right? But as far as probate to go all the way back to today, I think families in probate are going to be more motivated than ever. They have lost, they, they've lost jobs. They've lost stock values. They've lost a lot of things. And this is, as Jim, a lot of times says, this is found money. So the average inheritance in the United States is right under $177,000. And if you haven't been working, if you've been furloughed, you've been laid off, you've been fired, your business has failed and you inherit this house, all of a sudden it just looks like it looks like a piggy bank more than it ever has. So they're going to be more motivated to get these homes listed, get them on the market and get them sold at a competitive price. So this is, I always thought probate would be, a, it was a, or could be a recession proof model. I, we created this company coming out of the last recession and we've built it up until now. What's really interesting is, is I think a lot of other people believe that too, because our company has been growing where I haven't worked this hard. Hell, I don't know if I've ever worked this hard. I've, I've been burning at both ends. So the, the light, the, you know, the, the silver lining here is we like the skill set that, that the people on this call have is going to be one of the most valuable skill sets out there. Um, I saw an article on Enman this morning and I, it's not a great, it's not, it's not share worthy because it had a great headline, but I don't feel like the, the, the article really backed it up, but it was talking about how real estate will become local and having a niche is, is the, the, your, your path to prosperity is through niche real estate in your community. Well, there's no better example of that. And they didn't even mention probate because so few people understand this. I think that this could be for, for the probate expert, the people who have built the team and they have the mindset to help these families and they know how to protect equity and they can be on the leading edge of this. I think you have a chance to have one of the best years you've ever had because a lot of those families who procrastinate and sit around in probate quicksand, they're, they're going to be more motivated. 
the ones that are going to be dumping to investors, you know, a lot of, they may be willing to listen to a realtor because they might realize we need to get every dime out of this we can. So I think you're going to see a higher level of motivation in probate. I think you'll see less probate quicksand and more action from the families. Um, and I think that if you just go to our YouTube channel, if you're not already a probate expert, you have 700 hours of specialized training for free. Um, there's enough there to make you probably one of the, probably the top agent in your market if you just commit to this. So the, uh, the, the great silver lining, and I'm not just saying, I, I think you guys know me well enough by now, you'd know, I'd tell you, I, I'm obviously, you know, by it, like I, I may appear biased because I own, own a company that does that. But I, the reason I own a company that does that is because since 2011, when I first discovered it, I have thought it was the best insulating list that you could possibly have. It works in an up market. It works in a down market. It works with conventional tactics. It works with investor tactic. It works with creative financing tactics. It fit every part of my, every part of every stress test I put probate through. It seems to pass. So that's why I committed my career to it. And it's, I'm not saying this to sell you anything. I believe this will be the safest place for the next six months. And then there's lots and lots of opportunity in, in portfolio sales, investor sales, um, short sales, REO. There's tons of distressed asset opportunities, but we've got to wait for those this time, which is really unique. Hey, Chad. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the things that Bruce and I see here in the Memphis, Tennessee area market, uh, we still got a real pin up um, group of buyers. Mm -hmm. uh, everything that comes on the market here that's priced right sells in a day or two. And so what we're going to be pushing to do, and you tell me if we're right here, trying to get our probate uh, leads to you know, list and sell at a very reasonable price. And we feel like we can then move our probate stuff in, you know, two, three days to a week. What do you think? Yeah. So I think, um, I call that pricing ahead of the market, like in, in conditions like this. And that's good language to use for your seller because they can understand it. So, you know, we, we believe that, that, you know, if, if we sit around and wait that the group of buyers we have now will already have bought something else or will no longer qualify. So what I'm suggesting, Mr. Seller, is that we price ahead of the market, meaning that we're gonna intentionally price at a low price and we're gonna get it, we're gonna get multiple offers and lots of activity. And I just want you to know I'm gonna absorb that stress. That's not your stress, that's mine. And it's not stressful for me. It's fun. But we're gonna we're gonna use pricing to attract people to your listing. So chances are we'll have multiple offers to review and I'll coach you through that. Just know you never have to sell for this price. This is a marketing price. And we're going to get offers above this because we're going to communicate with the buyer's agents and tell them that they need to make their highest and best offer. We're going to review them once. You're, under, you're stressed. You don't have time to do this. We're going to call for offers and we'll review them on one single day so everyone can bring their highest and best offer. And then we'll be able to choose from those and not play games. So we should be able to have this home under contract in seven days but we should see offers in as little as one day. And we're gonna let those people sit and, and wonder if they're gonna lose the house and raise their bids, raise their offers, raise their offers. It's kind of like an eBay mentality, does that make sense? So that's kind of how I would deliver it. You know, it's just help them understand that you're intentionally pricing low to get extra attention to drive their price up. Sounds like a strategy that we can use a lot here, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for being here, Jim. Good man. Margie. There you are. I found you today, Margie. All right. You're unmuted when you're ready, Margie. I'm here. How is Manhattan? How many masks did you get made over the weekend? Uh, ten. Ten. How and are your is your pace increasing? Are you getting better at it as you go? No, I've just been really, really busy. I had to get a website up and running, so I I was working on that. 
I saw uh, Sharon Richardson as a friend of mine. She's one of the executives for Exit Realty up in the Toronto area. And she's been doing it for about three weeks now, knocking out really nice ones too. I mean, they are, they're like pleated, you know, with really nice fabric and they're pleated as though they look really good. She, she knocked out 80 over the, this past weekend. So her pace is increasing. Like she does like 20% more every weekend. She's getting more efficient. And what is she doing with the masks? Uh, they're donating, uh, you know, I don't know what her distribution is for them. Uh, she's churned out several hundred. I'm not sure who who they're actually giving them to. Well, uh, when I finish this, I have one more website to go. And then after that, uh, I'll go back. To, I'll be able to do more sewing. But I have to get the website up. Um, so you ask a question, Margie asks, uh, you know, a lot of people in New York have pulled their properties off the market and the percentage who are willing to put on the, go back on the market is way down. Um, anything that you think we can do to encourage people back into the market. So Margie, especially in your price point, um, I mean, how many, like with, with, I would, I would point to the, the economics of it because you're in an incredibly high price market that is priced above conventional loan limits. So jumbo lending has become an incredibly challenging space right now. There are people who can write jumbo loans, but few and far between and their, their underwriting standards are getting higher and higher. So I would point to the economics and say, you know, listen, if, 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 if I'm wrong, <clears throat> we'll find out we can price aggressively. And, and, you know, if, if, if people give you today's top price, but I, it's hard for me, Mr. Seller to see in this environment, especially with, with the, the, the shift in thinking that we're about to see the shift in consumer habits we're about to see and un the un unemployment we're about to see, it's hard for me to imagine that the mar that, that prices are going to appreciate the way they have in the last year. It's pretty easy for me to see a downward price correction because so many buyers are going to be taken out of the marketplace just because of, not because of the, the real estate market itself, but because of lending markets and how that's affecting access to capital. So can you see how I'm trying to, to weigh your risks? Like I think that there's, a 10% chance the market could go up from here in the next 90 days. And I think there's about an 80% chance it's going to go down at least some in the next 90 days. Now, well, I'm just going to interrupt you to say that actually the market in New York has been going down uh, steadily. Aren't so you down like 14% from peak already? Oh, I think even more. Yeah, the last article I read had tracked Manhattan prices had fallen 14% from the peak. And it was trending down and Toronto is kind of going through the same thing, like some of these overbought cities. So, I mean, there you go. I mean, you can already draw the trend. So Mr. Seller, Mr. Owner, you know, we, we've already fell on X, fallen X percent from the peak. And that was in this robust Trump economy. So what happens now that the markets that they were bragging about in this robust economy, those markets have been trashed. Unemployment is at, at you know, historic levels. And a lot of people aren't going to be going back to work, but they don't know that yet because they don't know the small business they worked for didn't survive because we have, this hasn't played out. So can you tell me why you think it's smarter to sit and hold something that you know you need to sell? Okay. So basically I'm going to be projecting that if they don't get it on the market soon, then they're going to lose even more money. Yep. And I firmly believe that. And then the higher the price, the more, the more equity they lose. Right. Okay. Luxury, luxury. And like, I mean, it doesn't even have to be luxury in your market to be, you know, above a half a million, but um, anything over 509,000 stands to have a pretty hard hit right now. Well, 509,000 in New York, the only thing you could buy is a studio apartment. <laughs> I hate right. to tell you. That's what I'm saying. And, and look at that. So, and say, you know, you need to understand Mr. Mr. Owner, if the market freezes, even if prices don't get absolutely trashed, what's most likely to happen is the market will freeze because of people behaving the way you are right now. So when mm -hmm. the, when the buyers take the sidelines, the seller take the sidelines, does that mean you have property taxes? Does that mean you're paying for utilities and X, Y, Z, like point to the holding costs, point to the, 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 the expected loss of equity, and look at the, just the economics of this because they're already emotionally, they're just like, ah, it's too much. I can't think about it. 
but their fear is that, you know, in, in an environment like this, people are afraid because they don't know how much they're going to lose, including their income and their savings. Um, so say, listen, we, this is something we can control. There's a lot of things we can't control. I can't help you with your retirement account, but you have an asset right here that has a, a short period where it can be liquid at today's value. Let's take advantage of that before it becomes less valuable. And, and worst case scenario, it becomes less valuable and a, more of a drag on your personal finances. Uh, I know this is a crazy question, Chad, but do you have any idea of how long you think realistically it will take three years, four years? Yeah, I think that, I think we've got to, we have more, we will, we will have more distressed assets to clear than we ever have. I think that you're going to see more big portfolio sales because even in 2008, we, the banks were choking on those, on the REOs. They couldn't even process them. And a lot of people don't understand like the, how that happened. And a lot of stuff had still remained behind the curtain and on their books but we never did really recover from 2008. We just were good at jangling the keys saying, looky here, all our stocks in real estate. And people quit paying attention and started looking at whatever we, whatever we showed them. But there was still a lot of distress left in the systems from 08. So I would say, you know, I think things will start, will start to clear that backlog. We'll, we'll find, out, find out what the bottom of the market is within the next six months. Uh, or excuse me, within the next 12 months, we'll certainly know what the floor is. And then we'll spend probably three to five years cleaning up and, and getting the economy fully back online, like to, 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 to you know, first quarter production levels. Um, but we're going to come back with some of the small businesses not there. A, a large percentage of the small businesses won't be there, won't be part of that recovery. Um, so I, I think you know, we've got unemployment is going to be the, the, the longest fight. If you look at, at the bump, you know, if you look at unemployment over time, 2008, 9, 10, 11 was kind of a little bump. And then it, it, it it's pretty stable. And now it's this massive spike. So uh, we don't know what that number is, but a good number of those 17 million people that are currently on UI benefits aren't going to be coming back to work. And it's going to take us a while to put those jobs back online and get small businesses back in place. So I think recovery within 12 months will begin. And I think it'll be five years before we're fat and happy again. Okay. But through all that, I mean, just like through all of that, I still remain very optimistic about probate just because it's, it's the people, those people, you know, the families are going to be in this economy too. So no, gonna- I agree. To- I totally agree about that. That, that, that the probate will be the biggest um, segment of the market that will move as long as they're buyers. Problem in New York is, right, at least in New York, the problem is that um, once the city is able to go out of their houses again, you know, people, then I think people will be hesitant to buy. So there are many fewer buyers. Yeah. And I mean, that, that's the time where if, if the buy side, if you're, you know, if your demand side dries up, that's where, you know, you can use things like creative financing to sweeten the deal for other buyers. And you can appeal to other people, like the people who no longer qualify for financing, but do have, you know, do have a down payment and they do have a job. We can sell homes to those people and we can sell them off market even. And, you know, we could buy them and sandwich ourselves into them. So, that's one of the things like in, in session four, we looked at those seven specific ways to basically break this log jam and make the market move forward. Creative financing is one of the ways to do that. Like you go to the buyers who normally, normally aren't, you know, aren't considered by us. Um, I'm coaching a guy in, uh, in Dallas, Texas, who actually specializes in this. Like he, in his market, he has, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, international buyers who have a green card, but not citizenship. So they don't, they can't quite participate in, in traditional lending, but they absolutely have cash. They absolutely can, can work on homes and get them fixed up. So they specialize in that, you know, median price range and, and owner financing every deal and they're doing it. And then they take the notes and sell them off to a big note buyer at 80, like 87 cents on the dollar. And then they take, go back and do it again. 
So they're thinking very creatively in a market where all those people could be renters. They're turning them into buyers and letting them have, you know, home ownership as part of their American dream. And New York has lots of immigrants too. There's lots of immigrants who make money, run businesses that can absolutely afford to buy. I mean, hell's bells. If you can afford to live in New York, you have to be able to afford to buy because rent is way more expensive than buying, right? So, yeah, but the immigrants don't live in Manhattan. Yeah, well, yeah I'm not saying yeah. that that yeah. might not be your niche. Your niche might be, you know, financial guys or it might be business owners. But you find people who, who you know, or, or uh, people of Islamic faith, like they don't participate in U.S. banking. They love owner financing because it matches what it matches their culture. It's mm -hmm. a, share, a shared risk finance, right? I so, didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So you should, you should learn more about that. Learn more about uh, uh, how like Muslim finance and it's more the traditional, but the way I learned it was here in Roanoke when I put up lease option, anytime I listed a lease option that was more than a quarter million bucks, which here represents the higher end of the market, you know, that's, that's median and above. Um, anytime I would get to get, you know, Muslim buyers who would come out and be like, yeah, we've got a hundred thousand dollars down. We, we want to do this and that. And so they, that, they taught me about it. And I'm like, why do you, why don't you just go to the bank? Like you know, they have all this money and all this, you know, you could be using credit and they don't, they don't participate. So learn about that. Um, oh. And you might become, you know, you might become the top listing agent that, you know, or like you're all, you could sell all of your listings to that buyer community. That's a fa fantastic idea, yeah. which I was completely unaware of. Yeah. Well, now you know your homework for the rest of the week. Yeah. Now I know. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Thanks for being here, Margie. It's my pleasure. All right. Who's next? Next up. Um, Jennifer said, I'm a new client. I've not called my lead yet. I've studied the scripts that you have and I'm hesitant because of our current situation and do not come off as callous. Should we be, this was on Facebook. This is why I'm reading it. I don't think I can unlock Jennifer. Uh, should we be shifting our script to include the COVID situation? So Jennifer DeVivo, um, check out the April role play call. We, we show you some of the ways to enter these conversations now. Um, Michael. Michael without an E, you are, I hope I'm not butchering your name. I think you pronounce that Michael, maybe Michelle. Are you there? You had a question about buying rentals. All right. Maybe no microphone. Um, Michael said, is it smart to keep buying rentals or better to wait? If, if you do think, if you do think better to wait for a lower price, how soon would you start? So as far as I'm assuming you're, you're meaning single family home rentals, um, which is, I mean, really strong coming into this. Uh, multifamily was a little overbought and I think you're going to see some pain in that space. Single family is pretty and, and rents are getting high in some markets. So I think you're going to see rents settle out. So the thing that makes me most nervous about long-term buy and hold investments right now is the uncertainty about the forbearance environment. You know, some cities have said not at all. Some cities have said 60 days Anything with an FHA, VA, USDA, you know, anything with a government-backed loan, which is over 75% of, of every, every mortgage in the country. Um, if it's government-backed at all, you've got six months. And there's hint, a lot of people hinting around at 12 months. So my concern with rental property is, especially if, it, if there's already a tenant in there, um, what happens if, you're, if your tenant quits paying rent? Um, you have to think about that situation. So you owe taxes, you owe insurance, you have to take care of everything. You have all the obligations under landlord tenant law, but you don't have any revenue and no one's probably going to bail you out right now. I don't see any reliable proof that as a landlord, you can actually be bailed out for the lost rents that you have. There's a lot of great talk and a lot of encouragement, 
but I've yet to see proof. So that's making me pretty bearish on, uh, on buying rentals right now. Now there's all, I try to always give you a silver lining. Like if I'm going to show you a problem, I'll try to show you an opportunity. Um, the opportunity here, especially if you can acquire the deals through creative financing, if you can give the seller a contract for deed, show them how that you can buy it on a contract for deed, meaning the seller gets to hold title. They don't transfer it. You can show them how you can pay them full price, no money down, typically pay them full price, no money down. And if something goes sideways, they have the deed. They don't have to go to through foreclosure. So you can mitigate their risk. You can hopefully motivate them to, to sell the home to you and then sell it to them basically on an installment sale. So instead of you selling it to me and getting all the cash right now and paying those capital gains, we're actually going to release that money to you over time. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to buy this home for, for no money down. I'll pay you full price. And we're going we're gonna to sell it, on, have it on a contract for deed. I will actually take title in a land trust. So we, there's things that we can do to mitigate risk for both of us. Um, we'll roll the deed into a land trust. I will then put a tenant in the, play, in the house and we'll try two different things from a tenant standpoint. One is section eight. Two is a furnished rental. So you decide whatever, whatever neighborhood you're buying in. If you, if you go to court furniture or Aaron's furniture, you can, you can lease an entire furniture package of electronics and everything, and it's going to be more expensive. But if you don't have the cash flow right now, or if you don't want to, I'm, I'm trying to show you ways to take like no risk whatsoever, get a house under contract on contract for deed, go put a HUD tenant, get it HUD, HUD approved and put a HUD tenant in there. Get it on contract for deed, go to air and go get furniture or like fully furnished thing and then lease it out on travelingnurse.com. Like look for traveling nurse rentals. There's a couple of, there's like furnished.com or travelingnurse.com and take lower your rent down than, than the typical because your rent, your rent for, for furnished apartments is usually quite a bit higher, usually twice. And at least even here, it's twice what it is for an unfurnished rental. So you've got room to play in here. This is why I'm suggesting this. So undercut the furnished rentals on the market, but come in above so you can obviously make some money and pay for the furniture. Come in above what you would do is just a, an unfurnished rental. And by undercutting that market, you can demand six month prepaid rent and mitigate that risk. So try to lease to a healthcare professional try to get six months of prepaid rent for the discount. If you can't just make sure they have, you know, they have a strong position and they're not likely to be laid off within the healthcare system. Um, and you'll probably be okay anyways. Um, but those are some ideas that where those are things that I would be comfortable doing. I, I would be comfortable taking my own medicine. Like if I had an opportunity to buy a house subject to contract for deed, owner finance, wrap mortgage right now, I have no money out of my pocket. Um, it's basically non-recourse and, and all of those scenarios, there's no personal recourse on me. Um, and I can show the seller how I can lock in their price, mitigate their risk and pay them out three to five years from now when we're in a different lending environment. And then once I get control of the asset for hopefully for free, most likely for free, once I have control of it, then there's those, those couple of ideas that I can do to get a very, a very low likelihood of default tenant in place. So I, I, if, if you isolate the conversation to what little opportunity I see in buying and long-term buy and hold, I'm really, really bullish on that because I can show you, you can take zero dollars and go build yourself a rental portfolio. Um, but you got to think creatively and, uh, and you've got to be able to explain the benefits to the sellers and to the tenants. So those are my ideas. And I guess you don't have a microphone. So um, hopefully that, that uh, covered, covered your question. Lisa. Hey, Lisa, you are unmuted if you'd like to join us. I'm talking about Massachusetts probate. Uh, Lisa said, I've not involved, been involved with the probate market for a while. What are the best practices now? What has changed significantly, if anything? Not a whole lot has changed. Um, being in New England, um, you 
you know, there's, there's more, I think people are more cautious up there because there's you're, you've been hit harder. Um, however, things are still moving forward. So the, if you listen to role, the April role play call that we did last Wednesday, I think that'll help you change up your, you know, kind of see what, what lang what pivots you need to have in your language to help, um, you know, get engagement on the phones. But I guess the biggest change is this probably became a more valuable list since the last time you worked it. Um, there's, there's more opportunity here. There you are. I didn't realize you were unmuted. Yeah, no, I just unmuted. I, I had, um, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't select the unmute yourself. Well, yeah. I was curious about that as well as um, what has your experience been overall with an I, with iBuyer platforms? Have you found that, um, you know, the, the, that there's, there's a way to identify some of these properties as really great buy boxes for iBuyer type buyers. Has that been something that you guys have, have been working? You know, I've been sort of out of your loop for about a year, but I've always continued to get your emails and I look and all of a sudden a, a light went off in my head about uh, the future and um, I've been circling back around again and actually just sent an email to you guys. Yeah. Um, I just want to hear what's going on with that stuff. So I think, you know, uh, Warren Buffett said, when, when the tide goes out, you find out who's been swimming naked. And we, <laughs> we, we see what happened with all the VC-fueled iBuyers, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to hear a report from your side. Is EXP holding there? Or are they still, is their program still active for you? Oh, my God, it's unbelievable. Yeah, because it's pretty varied. and it, It's really different. It really does work. It, it really is more created as another solution to offer to a, to a seller. Right. There's no guarantee of anything, but that, you know, if it fits a profile very specifically, um, then... You know, um, and, and I, I think the, the EXP model just had us trained. I just finished a two day, took me two days because it was kind of long. The uh, Express Offer Certification Program that they have, it has not been rolled out in mass yet. We're in probably over 40 states. Uh, mass, I think, will be rolled out within the next month. Um, so again, it's just another possibility, but gosh, it seems like it could be such a great possibility for probates. I didn't know how you guys what that looked like in the past year. Has that been, a, have they been players or not? So we, um, you know, we, we basically train our folks. So I buyers aren't necessary. Right. So what EXP is doing for their, their, bro for their, their agents and brokers is really encouraging to me. I think it's going to be way more sustainable than, than what the, the I buyers brought to the table. You know, the, the ones who led that charge, um, basically what we've been teaching all along is kind of what you guys are doing, right? So offer multiple solutions. One mm -hmm. could be, one could be brokerage. One could be acquisition. One could be creative financing. So we, our folks have been offering that all along. Like we, you know, we'll provide them three options. Like for, for example, we've got a, uh, one of our guys in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, he's competing with all the traditional I buyers, 8,000 investors and 21,000 realtors. And he, 60% of his transactions are actually on the acquisition side and he's paying 55 cents on the dollar. Cause once they realize that 90% offer from Zillow, actually once they realize all the, yeah. fee, the fees yeah. that get put in, insane. Yeah. then they don't feel like that that person really, they feel like they were deceived. They mm -hmm. end up going with David anyways. Mm -hmm. so he's making over a million dollars a year offering basically that model. I can help you in these ways. And that's really what we teach everybody. So don't focus on yourself and your outcome. Focus on the people and the situation and let them choose, you know, what best fits them and the outcome they want. So having that and that is an arrow in your quiver, having a cash offer within 24 hours that that's legit mm -hmm. is a great tool because everybody wants to talk about it, even though 10% of them will actually be motivated enough to use it that still starts the conversation and differentiates you from everyone else. So absolutely it's valuable. Yeah, it definitely, it's, it's not a guarantee at all. You know, you sort of say, look, I'll go back and I'll see. And then you really have to wait for an offer from, from the platform. And, and, uh, and if it does fit, you know, then you have something else to offer. And, and in, in lots of cases, that's what's been in my mind that it will become more and more viable, especially I'm in a second home market. Right. So I always say I got a lot of sellers that want to sell and buyers that want to buy, but nobody has to do a damn thing. Well, suddenly that may that, or maybe not so suddenly that may be changing as some of my 
you know, the, mo the modest people who bought a second home because they had grown so much equity in their primary here in Mass. I mean, I mean it, was, it was crazy, you know, what, how, how their homes had appreciated. They took some of that cash out and bought a little mid 300s, three bedroom ranch on the Cape. Well, you know, as the, as the months wear on here, um, unloading that may become far more attractive because they didn't need it to begin with. So yeah. I'm trying to, you know, look a few months down the road and see what tools I need to, uh, how I need to pivot. And it occurred to me that um, you guys may be one of the ways I need to pivot. Another thing, Lisa, <laughs> are you in Boston? Where are you? No, I'm on Cape Cod. Okay, which town? So I did the program. I'm in Mashpee, but I work on the whole Cape. I mean, I just closed two things in, in North Truro, which is like 90 miles from where I am. And yeah. I work on the South Shore, Plymouth area, if I need to, but primarily the Cape. That's my, my market. So there's, there's a lot of cash around you. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I would say for you personally, like EXP is great. And I think their iBuyer program is, is, is a great support for, for you. However, if I would also have, you need to have relationships with the cash. So find out who has cash and, and is, is looking to go into real estate um, and, and spend time on that. Like, especially right now, like any, make reconnect with, with anybody you can. But um, I know there's a lot of liquidity. Um, a lot of folks have been sitting on the market because of the credit bubble that's been forming all along. Then uh, your market has, you know, some pretty high net worth folks that aren't afraid to step in and, and, in a big way in real estate. And I know some folks um, between like Plymouth and, and like on, on the lower part of the arm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Up, uh, that's what we call the upper Cape. That's where I am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I know several folks there that, that are, you know, in, in real estate and, and do know several investors. So if you ever do need cash, like right now, um, I, I would, I would, I would encourage you to have solutions in place for that too. Like where can you come up with a million dollars worth of, of cash in the next seven days to clear three of those houses um, for a guy who's going through a divorce because he's been trapped in his apartment in Boston with his wife yeah, and he, yeah. she's not going to be his wife. <laughs> Yep. Um, who, where can you unload all three of their of their Airbnb properties? Because it's going to be months before they see any any revenue off of those. Oh, and there's nothing that's going to open up that that's been completely closed down. You know, that's right. a big piece of our business here. So Everybody if EXP is if EXP is not the right fit, like if you have to upload them to a platform as listings and then wait, and there's no guarantee, make sure just backstop yourself and make sure you do have a guaranteed cash mm -hmm. buyer. Now you can't right, guarantee. Maybe we can talk right. offline about that because I would certainly appreciate uh, any connections that we can we can make. And again, I, I did uh, reach back out to your sales team. Okay. Uh, to have that conversation again. Cool. Well, welcome back. You guys, you guys have always just been on it. You really have. I've even I've always appreciated the the training, the 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 quality of it, the thoroughness of it. Um, I'm around a lot of training. I'm and and I just I've, I, and I said that to Jim when I left. You know, I said that to everybody when I left. Um, it, it, you guys have done a great, a great job with the program. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. We're happy to have you back. All right. From Facebook, Patrick McDermott said the courts in mass closed due to public closed to the public absent emergencies until May 4th, no research options. Um, So that he was reporting on uh, what he's seeing in mass. Ronit says, I have two probate listings in contract. On one, the tenants are not moving out and buyer wants it vacant. On a second, limited administration and court cannot okay the transaction. Um, Ronit, I'm going to see if I can find you on our Zoom. I wish I could talk to you. Not here. Um, so Ronit, that, that one's, um, if you want to get on a coaching calendar, you can call support, call, call our main number or email support at all the leads. If you want some help with, with troubleshooting those two deals, um, see if you can get on our coaching calendar. Yeah. So Victor had said from, from what I researched, well, you guys may have read this. I'm realizing I'm re reading out of the chat. Um, Victor had brought up that we're working on immunity testing. So let me, um, Victor, you're unmuted if you want to join the conversation. So 
this is something I like for me, it's really important that I, I think I had this um, the first week of, of December through the third week of January. I had uh, something that can only be explained. Like if you read the, the severe end of the spectrum, uh, like the severe symptoms of COVID-19, it's basically what I had. Um, though I believe I've had it. My girlfriend is in Toronto. Uh, her dad has ALS. So we made a choice to stay in our respective countries and um, I haven't seen her for five weeks. So I'm trying to get, um, you know, that's, that's, it's important to me to get the immunity test. I can't find one. Um, I, I've heard word that there's a lab in Austin, Texas, where I have a friend and there's one in Norfolk, Virginia, but I can't actually get any. No one I know has actually been able to get one. Um, they hear they're available, but they're not actually able to get them. So uh, I'm saying all that to, to say, you know, uh, Victor had said, you know, it's, it's the government's going to be looking to, to basically give you a card like you'll have your I, I've, I think I jokingly said that on a call the other night. It's your Nazi papers. Um, nobody thought that was funny, but you literally need to have your papers to, to, to walk around. But uh, I want to get my papers so I can go back to Canada because I spend a lot of time up there. Um, so I'm not too encouraged uh, at how quickly that, that immunity testing will actually happen. I think that that could take months or, or years <laughs> just based on how quickly things have been deployed. I mean, if you look at the actual infection testing, that's far more important right now. And we haven't been able to properly, you know, get that into place. So as far as the immunity testing helping us, as far as, as getting back to life as normal, I wouldn't count on it. Um, now that I say that, I see your follow-up. And Victor, if you can message me, I think you're over on, um, if you can message me, I want to see where you got your test because I have had people looking everywhere. Um, and I've yet to have, have anyone get one. So I want to know which lab you got it from and, and what you had to go through to get it. Cause I want to go back to Canada. <laughs> All right. Manny Martinez cash buyers. Let me find you, Manny. All right, Manny, you're uh, able, to, able to talk if you have a microphone. Hey, Chad, hey. how are you? I'm good. How are you, man? I'm doing well, thanks. Where are the cash buyers hiding? That's your job, man. You're not supposed to ask me that. <laughs> so everywhere. Um, I think a lot of people were smart enough to, uh, I hope, a lot of people were smart enough to roll out of stocks and the bonds and, and the money market. And they're, you know, a lot of... Uh, I think the market recovery you see now, in my opinion, is fools rushing in. Um, they're they're doing it based on emotion, not not on economics or logic. So I think you're, there's a lot of more intelligent. Like, I, well, that's going to sound pompous. I, what, people who I would perceive to be financially intelligent right now are not rushing back into markets. They're they're at most sitting in in money market accounts or they've already liquidated that and they've got it out in their bank accounts. They've got it in cash. So if you talk to financial advisors who are losing assets and say, listen, man, you know, I, I know that you can't make a commission on the things that I do with private capital. However, if you're losing clients, if they're cashing out and rolling to cash, I can help. I can basically take your position I can show them how to preserve and grow that cash. And then eventually, you know, they're going to invest back into the stock market with you. So you do what you can to keep the relationship. I'll, I'll, you know, be an extension of your, like your reputation is attached to mine. We'll both, we'll, we can both talk to them, but I'll go do the work and show them how to make 10, 12% on their money um, as a private lender, or I'll go out and find them assets and show them how to make 15 to 30% on their money. And so think about that. Think about going around to financial advisors who are losing clients. And instead of losing those clients, they can basically have those clients on the sideline being your clients for a while. And then you can refer them back to them when they're ready. So financial advisors is, is one idea um, as far as, ma you know, making them easy to find. But also look around. There's a lot of Facebook groups, meetup.com, like go to your local RIA. Um, 
you know, be talking to any, anyone you can that, that has contact with people who, who you think might have cash. And, and, you know, there's a lot of lists out there. You can buy a cash buyer list. In my experience, those are crap. Um, the other a really good way to find, are you in brokerage, Manny? Yes, or investment? Yeah. Both. Yeah. So go get a short sale under, get a listing on a short sale. Um, any, any kind of distressed asset you can get and you're going to make some sign riders and they're going to be the goofiest, most unprofessional thing you've ever done, but they're not going to break your MLS standards or rules. And they're obviously going to be legal, but you're going to put things like um, flip this house smells like money, catching a falling knife, um, your next project, anything like that. That's like, what is that? Is that a real estate sign to get them to look at? I did this in 2012 and I got absolutely covered up with buyer leads. I was a brand new agent. I didn't want to work buyers, but I had, I mean, it was just like found money. My buy business, like my first year, I think I did 20, 26 on the buy side and, and I did 26 on the buy side, 28 on the sell side and probably three dozen off market in my first full year here in Roanoke. I knew nobody. And I will, I attribute a lot of it to those stupid sign riders. It cost me 10 bucks to put one on top of a sign, but I would get sign calls like crazy. And then I would convert them off of the distress listing and turn them into conventional buyers. Um, but the other thing I realized any landlord who, you know, when they go through and check on their houses, they drive the whole neighborhood and they're driving for dollars looking for opportunity. Right. Mm -hmm. Those sign riders were like investor magnets. I found so many landlords that were had owned homes in the neighborhood and they're like, what is this smells like money thing? Is that house for sale or what the hell's going on? Well, Hey, I'm glad you called it. It sounds like you might own property in the neighborhood. And I would just strike up a conversation. I built most of my buyers list off those dumb sign riders. And I had no idea it was going to be like a great cash buyer magnet. I was just trying to get people who were afraid of short sales, not to be afraid of short sales by not, uh, you know, I had riders that said short sale, but I was like, eh, no, that's not getting a great response. What if I change it up? So I've got all kinds of these quirky sign riders. It's like 10 bucks, but that was one of the, the, the best surprises in, in getting my business built here in Roanoke. I couldn't believe how many cash buyers called off of those. So anything that would indicate distress and just be very different that wouldn't blend in. So imagine he's, he's driving down the road, talking on the phone and it still catches his attention. It, it, it begs more attention than the conversation he's having in the truck. Um, that kind of stuff like that, that'll help you find cash buyers right now. It's really tough. I mean, I would normally tell you go anywhere where like any kind of auction environment. So a trustee sale an absolute auction, but those aren't really happening right now. Right. Right. Um, and then if you have, do you own any of your own real estate? Oh yeah. Do you have any, are you selling anything right now? No, I do have a, a tenant turnover, but I, it looks like I might have a tenant in the wings already. So I, I was entertaining the idea of selling that property, but I'm not. Um, so remember as a seller, um, you can decide to change your mind and this is, you need to be able to make sure you, you can stand up to this but you could throw one of your own assets out on the market at a low price um, and then just decide, Oh, something changed. I'm actually in better shape than I thought. My more rents came in than I expected, Mm -hmm. but you're going to get a bunch of offers. Sure. Um, So just understand, like understand the ethics of that. If other buyers agents are selling that, Mm -hmm. um, then there's obviously some ethical challenges there. But if you're finding your own buyers, if you can attract buyers to one of your own assets, um, it's a bit of a bait listing, but who knows? You might get a number that you'll, you'll take. <laughs> like, oh, crap. Yeah, I'll take that. Now, I, have a, I have a question about something that you said with the financial planners. If we are doing private mortgages, could that financial pl- planner participate in any points that are collected? If you make them a principal of your entity, they can. So they need to be on your operating agreement. So if you wanted to cut a deal like that with them, um, then you would need their brokerage to be a principal in the entity you use as, as the mortgagor. 
I think. I mean, at least on bigger deals, like on syndication, that's, that's the case. So if, if, if I have a series six or a, a seven and I want to go raise capital for another sponsor, if that sponsor will make me a partner, if they put me on their operating agreement, then I can receive commissions through my brokerage, through my series. So I'm assuming it's going to be the same way for, for that. It's, it's unregulated lending, but I was, thinking, um, I was thinking differently. I was thinking um, the scenario would play out where a financial planner and our company would create a third entity where we're partners and that entity um, could go ahead and lend some of the private money that the, that the financial planner would have access to. We go find the borrower, they provide the capital and we share in the profits. That's, that was my thinking. And I didn't think that they needed to have any kind of licensing. So commercial lending is, is unregulated, right? But what that broker is going to broker brokers are very conservative in my, in my experience, even RIAs. Um, they're going to be worried about is, is that, what, what are you talking about? A mini REIT? Are you talking about a REIT? Because we, we have REITs. We put our clients into REITs and, my answer is yeah or like no absolutely not REITs are big bloated things where all the sponsors and the managers make all the damn money not the investors mm -hmm. like we're talking about creating a vehicle that would be similar to a REIT um it's it's kind of like a REIT kind of like mortgage-backed securities but with way more security and way less fees um if if we can you know if you guys do this and I just I just use it as my blind pool of capital can you do that and I would, I would aim for registered investment advisors. They're going to have a little higher standard of education and, and be a little more creative. And I would also look at, even within that, look at independent firms. You don't want to go to an Edward Jones with that because they're probably not going to be able to, to play ball, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you can, I think you, you, there's certainly ways to do it if you find the right broker who's motivated to think outside of the box. And just as long as he makes sure he's compliant, but it could be a great retention tool for them. So when a guy is ready to roll to cash, be like, all right, listen, we'll roll you out to this and then we can invest in, in, in this. And if you do it as an LLC, then why can't they start selling, you know, they could even sell shares to their own company. <laughs> um, so anyways, there's, there's a lot of ways you can do stuff like that. It's finding a broker that's willing to do it. I tried it in 2012, 2013. Um, I tried to get financial advisors here to, to engage with me and, and doing that. Cause I, I, like I went in with, with actual kind of a portfolio. I'm like, listen, here's what I bought it for. Here's what I sold it for. Here's what I paid the lender or, you know, here's what I would have paid a lender. And I'm like, we need to get some of your guys out of stocks and into real estate. And they just, you know, they weren't having it. But right now is a great time, like when, when their guys are like, oh, listen, I don't know what to buy, so I'm just rolling the cash. I'm getting out. Um, now is a great time to try to go put that together. Yep. All right. Thanks, Manny. Um, yeah, so Manny, let me see if you're still I'll unmute you. I saw your follow-up. Would you use the price strategy on luxury listings? Yes. Um, this can work really well with any asset. I, I kind of borrowed it from the commercial real estate world, like how distressed assets call for offers. Mm -hmm. And I started doing this. I would list on Thursday night, call for offers, and only and without, with no exception, I would only review and respond to offers the following Friday. So it was basically seven full days of exposure, and then we would we would respond. And I've, I mean, I've done it on just about every price. Um, I mean, you know, it's what it's, it's the norm in commercial real estate on very high price assets. So even on those luxury, the luxury listings, they're more likely to be conditioned to that kind of environment. Like with, if you noticed sellers quit pricing a lot, a lot of brokers quit pricing their multifamily three, four years ago, instead of pricing it, they now call for offers. Um, and we're, we're not going as far as not offering a price with, for the asset. We're just saying, here's an, here's an aggressive price in, in seven days, we're going to look for highest and best offers. So yeah, I think for your luxury listings, it absolutely will work. Okay. 
All right, we'll go back over to the questions box here. Um, Manny said, I thought you had to be an attorney to join the bar associations. No, you can actually join the bar as an affiliate member in most states. I have seen some people reject it, but in most, in most states, you can um, join the bar as an affiliate member. Uh, Charles said, what is a court confirmation? Is that only in California? So Charles, it, it's um, in, in, a, in a lot, in some states, not, not the majority, but in some states, you, you, in order to close real estate, you do need um, court the, the authorization from the court. So in Florida, it's as simple as you take the contract to the next hearing. The judge will review that, call for objections, and they will approve, they can approve the sale and the family can move forward. In California, what Bill was talking about, there's actually an overbid process. So you take the contract, you give it to the court, the court appoints a referee, the referee gives them a value, and then during the next hearing, they call for an overbid, which is a 10% premium above the, the, the current contract price. And that person has, to, it's a lot like a trustee sale at that point. Um, so that's, that's, that's in California. I think Nevada is very similar. But in, in a lot of places, um, Charles, I don't know if you're, let me see if I can find you here. Yeah, it's, I don't see you, but in a lot of places, it, it's not the case. You don't need it. Like here in Virginia, I could list, list and sell a probate right now, no problem. Joyce said, what resources are best to use and easily available to get started with social platforms and web pages for beginners or with both? No microphone. That's a, so, man, there's just so much out there. Kat, you might be a good person to, to answer her on this. Um, HubSpot is, uh, you know, I've learned a lot from HubSpot, but they do get kind of advanced kind of quickly. Um, there's lots of great, like if, if you want, if, if you're talking about Joyce building your own web pages, um, there's some of the, the, you don't have the flexibility. You can't build out big, robust, like IDX sites, but, um, you can use like Wix, uh, GoDaddy has its own drag and drop web editor now and for, uh, Squarespace is another. And so those are common. So Wix, W I X Squarespace, all one word and GoDaddy are really, really simple. They, you don't have to learn everything that it takes to even me. Like when I put up a new WordPress site, I mean, it's, it's a quite a bit of work. So those drag and drop builders can be really helpful. Uh, as far as social platforms, I would say go to YouTube Joyce. I mean, there's, there are tons and tons of contributors out there that, that use YouTube to host their video and just say, how do I set up Facebook for business? How do I set up this and that? So there's everything you need is, is, probably there. Um, the other places there's actually, maybe you should start here because it's going to be a little more organized. Go to udemy.com, U-D-E-M-Y.com. And there's courses on there and they run promos all the time. You can get like a hundred hours worth of, of content on how to set up social media for like 10 or 12 bucks. Um, so you have udemy.com, lynda.com l-y-n-d-a.com cat back me up there's one more i can't think of you might be thinking of linkedin learn but i was gonna add well that's linda um, now Thank yep you. if you do anything with youtube just make sure you put 2020 in your search title because you don't want to watch a video on how to set something up on facebook that came out two years ago and now facebook has a totally different interface so absolutely and, and you'll still find, you're not going to narrow it down. You'll still find thousands of results just from this year alone of people telling you um, walkthroughs of everything you need to know on Facebook, how to create basic content, how to write sales copy, how to set up a business page, um, how to run basic ads on Facebook. Really everything you've got there, you'll be able to find. And there's so many different producers and influencers on YouTube. Your best bet is to dive in let YouTube kind of take you, it, it'll autoplay the next video for you. When you find an instructor and influencer you like, just subscribe to their channel and just absorb their information passively. Yep, good advice. So Joyce, uh, I think all that said, I am gonna suggest that you go to udemy.com 
and purchase the courses that have been created in the last year that have the most reviews. I mean, you can spend $10. It's kind of unbelievable the amount of value you can get for 10 bucks these days. Um, so I think that would be the best place to start for you uh, just because they're going to spend, you know, for 10 bucks, instead of trying to figure it all out on your own, they're at least, even if you spend $10 and they don't teach you everything, they'll at least teach you the basics and you'll know, you'll know what you don't know, or you'll know what you need to know. You'll know what you need to need to know. <laughs> Hollywood, Renee, where have you been? Let me find you here. I always go to R, even though I read it as Hollywood Renee. Okay. Miss Keish, you're unmuted if you want to join. What's up? <clears throat> How are you? Good. Good morning. Or good afternoon uh, for you. Sounds like you got a new objection. Yeah. God, what did I even type in there? It was a minute ago. <laughs> if the PR doesn't want to pay for vacant insurance, one, are we liable? Two, if the house yeah. burns down, I'm assuming our commission is SOL. Can we put any language in the listing agreement? Would attorneys still get our, I don't know what that Get paid. Was. Oh, a listing I currently have is a border. Uh, I guess that's a hoarder house, right? Or, yeah. Um, may have quarters was boarded up junk everywhere. Basically, what might my liability be? Uh, I don't think you have any personal liability. I mean, if if you, it's you know, I mean, it's their asset. They need to understand how to protect it. If you suggest that they get vacant insurance and they don't, I mean, that's clear that they had their best interest in mind and they made their choice. Like they chose their yeah. risk. So I don't, I don't think you have any liability at all. Okay, I didn't think so. I just kind of like asked the silly question once but yeah okay um and then you had a follow-up about a community bank in la i i don't know i don't have any community bank relationships in in your market what i, I would look for credit unions um those are really should be easier to find and uh, maybe start with them yeah i did look up for citizen i have navy federal credit union but they're so darn big they're and there's there's no one around here so i'm open yeah. to something Anyway, there's a couple I know of, but I just figured I'd throw it out to you. Okay. Yeah, they might be too big to, uh, to they, they, big wheels turn slow, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and they're super conservative, obviously. So, yeah. Obviously. Do you see the, the big settlement they paid out on the TCPA <laughs> lawsuit? I did see that. It's just, it's, you know, they've been good to me over the years. I mean, I've been with them since I was like 16 years old, but as far as any kind of flexibility or creativity or what you're pointing yeah. to that. Yeah. That's not them. But anyway, there's, yeah, some, there's a some lot of banks are around here that way too. Like it's, it's even some of the community banks we were talking to, they've, they've pulled back and that was, you know, on one of the really unfortunate things in 2008, the reason we have such a housing shortage um, regardless of prices, just of, as far as houses available is because banks reacted that way. So I, I, I get that, you need to do it temporarily. I just hope they loosen up a lot quicker than they did last time because it really does hurt the recovery. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, Thurman is sharing an update out of, oh, let me see here. Uh, Thurman said in New Jersey, the governor just incre the governor just increased the restrictions. If you're not wearing a mask and gloves, you can't be in public. How do I talk to potential clients without selling or even listing their property given this environment? In our entire MLS, we are only seeing two to three new listings. All right, I'm going to find you, Thurman. Hey, Thurman, are you there? Maybe you don't have a microphone. Okay, I'll do my best here. So. It's thing that the environment's getting even more restrictive where you are. How the, how do you do business in this environment? Right. Um, this is something we're going to cover on Wednesday, uh, from the seller side, we covered it on Friday in session eight. We talked about all the things you can do from a buyer standpoint. Um, so we'll, we'll really talk about this in depth on, on Wednesday on the operations on the seller side. But as far as talking about how to, how to, like how to prospect, um, you know, given the environment, like right now, nothing's happening. And what we're going to, what I believe, like going back to the beginning of this conversation, what I believe we're going to see is 
a very quick a quick burst that looks like a recovery, kind of like you're seeing in stocks right now, followed by reality setting in, asset prices falling, and and until they find a, a floor, uh, which might be as long as, as six to 12 months until we, we see what the, the forbearance is gonna cause for us. Um, and then we'll see the real recovery after that. So you can, you can encourage them to take advantage in, in the rally and you know point to the stock market and say you see what happened we you know we had this extreme sell-off and the news just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse so all it took was one little glimmer of good news the fed's printing money and the dow went from 18.5 back to 23,000, and nothing really changed the, the market fundamentals didn't change all, a lot of those companies like there's the reporting hasn't hasn't been in it was all driven on emotion and and uh confidence. So the same thing is going to happen in real estate. Let's, let's take advantage of that. Don't you want to be a part of that? Wouldn't you rather sell when, when emotions are good and before reality sets in and people realize that this isn't going to go away in, in six weeks and try to encourage them to get, you know, commit to selling. And then I would recommend you get a Rico 360 camera. It's a great little camera you can pick up for 250 bucks. Um, it's a, it's a tax write off. You can depreciate it. Um, whatever it's, I mean, it's, you need it in your business and then have an instru a laminated instruction sheet, put that in the mail with a pack of sanitary wipes, tell them exactly how to, and, or you could even just call them on the phone when they get the camera and walk them through the house, have them do the 360 tour. Um, and you don't even have to do that. You can have them do it, have them get, uh, send them a case for their phone with a wide angle lens on it and have them do it with that. Um, but any, or a GoPro, send them a GoPro 8. So it's, it's got amazing image stabilization. But get them to commit to sell. Get them the tools they need, even though you can't get over there. Do it through the mailbox and get the house on the market. Use the quirky sign routers. Use the, uh, one of the things I suggested last week was actually do a dating profile for the house. You're like, oh, yeah, she was born in 1968. She, you know, she loves this and that. But anything you can do to really make it stand out while people are trapped at home and you can lighten the mood and make it less threatening, um, get them on the market, get them out there, see, like, do anything you can. You know, I suggested the like tender for houses, like treat your houses like they're, they're individuals on tender and like make one a masculine, make one a guy, make one a girl. And, and send it to your local news channels and get, get your local ABC channel to, to talk about how, what this local realtor is doing to draw attention to their listings and just how creative they are. And look at this home tour, the sellers walking through touring their own home with a wide angle camera talking about, you know, they've given the house a name and this one's a female and this one's a male. And I'm just sharing goofy ideas that I think you can get some traction out of, especially right now where you guys are really in a restrictive environment anyone wants any kind of hope and humor and lightness that they can find. Right. So think like that. Think like, what the hell can I do to make this market move forward? Um, so show your sellers how it's in their best interest to go ahead and move out of the probate quicksand and, and take advantage of, of the equity while they still have it. And then show your buyers how much fun it can be and that, that, that they're fully capable. Um, uh, yeah. So, and I see a follow-up from you, Thurman, about this, the quirky sign riders. So some of my best ones and, and some of these are edgy and they did piss some people off, but I, I wasn't doing anything wrong. Um, short sale was one that obviously gets attention. Um, that's what I started with. Uh, flip this house with an exclamation was a really good one because people associate with that term. Uh, one that I would do now, um, would be like, uh, hey, Chip and Joanna, call me. And I would do like a call me emoji. Like emojis are now a big, like a lot bigger than they were back then. But people know who Chip and Joanna are. You're not going to be breaking any, any rules or anything. But do a sign writer that's like, hey, Chip and Joanna, call me. And people are going to make that connection and be like, Chip and Joanna, oh, my God, that must be an opportunity house. Like that's just like the ones they find on TV. Um, so that was mine was flip this house, but I would do something like that with an emoji. That's really going to draw attention. Um, let's see what was my other ones? Uh, <laughs> if I knew it was in the lower price range, 
and I knew it was going to be an investor buyer. I had one that I would throw in that said smells like money, obviously with the seller's permission. But if it was usually a tired landlord that was like the hell with it and they were just letting it go, you know, there would be they, the last tenant had pets and it was torn all to hell. And if you're an investor, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know what a house smells like when it has the most amount of equity for you, but you have to do the work and pull those carpets out and, and do all that. Um, so that one people didn't like very much, um, but damn if it didn't get the attention from the right people. And I would only have it up for a day or two. Um, what else? What Some of the other ones I had were uh, uh, Your Next Project was one or Your Next Flip. Um, gosh, I need to just go down to the shed and get, I need to have these to show off. All I have is, is a, these quirky ones. I don't have any good ones. Um, but I, I have, I still have a whole stack of these things. But anyway, those are some of the ideas, some ideas. Those are the ones I've used in the past. Um, yeah, so Renee, these are sign writers. So what I'm talking about is this is, uh, I think it's, I think it's, um, seven by 18 or six by 18. And it's just a, just a, an alum, aluminum sign writer and you can get them reskinned for, I think it cost me $5 to do two sides in all the co in full color. But, um, anyway, that uh, for like, I think they were $12. Uh, with the aluminum and, and the skin and then to get them reskinned, they were like five bucks or something. And I, I tried a whole bunch of them. I got a, my, my sign guy. He's like, you're an idiot. And I'm like, just do it. <laughs> um, but it worked. I, I got a ton of business from those. Um, Margie, no, uh, Margie, you to me there, cat got you. Sorry, I'm just catching up on comments. So, uh, Renee, check out Barry. Barry let, dropped you a note or dropped everybody a note in, in the chat. And uh, he said, looking at the California probate code, um, it requires the PR to sign and file with the petition an entire section labeled insurance states that the PR must determine that there is appropriate and adequate insurance covering the assets and risks of the estate for the entire period of the administration. Now, Barry, it, it, um, thank you for, for your citation. It, even, even though it says that, most people aren't doing that. Um, and most attorneys, for whatever reason, aren't, aren't suggesting vacant insurance for vacant houses. Um, So Ronit, I couldn't find you earlier. Let me see if I can find you now. Oh, there you are. So I'm not sure why, but Ronit, you should be available to talk now. Um, I was looking for you down in the R's and it wasn't showing you down there. You were at the top. Okay, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you well. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Um, what, do you, what do you got going um, on? Okay, so I have two in contract deals. Um, num probate number one, the courts are closed and it's limited administration. The judge wanted to talk to me about the pricing that we chose. That we chose um, mm -hmm. just over here in Brooklyn. There's a lot of um, some judges are overly concerned that people are selling their houses for too low of a price. Anyway, so she wanted to talk to me. This has been four weeks ago. Um, I'm not sure. I've asked people if this judge has an email address. I'm not sure how to get through to her so that we can move this thing along and do a virtual closing. And then the second one. Are they um, holding court, Ronnie? What? Is that judge still, are they still holding court in your market? No, they shut down the courthouse. Supposedly they're working remotely. Have you tried calling the probate clerk to see if she can get a message to the judge? So if the court is shut down, is anyone going to answer that phone? I don't know. They are here. Um, I actually called to make sure last week and you know, they're open for basically only attorneys and paralegals are in and out right now. 
but they and and uh, you know the employees and that's not the case in some places but i would at least try to call and see um, okay so i will call anything else i could do after i call is that if they don't answer the phone yeah i mean i would i would try to you know call the probate clerk um leave a voicemail uh I mean, it's in, in most cases, people are still staffing courthouses, so hopefully they're answering. Um, I would just call around the courthouse till you found somebody and say, listen, I'm trying to find the judge who, had a, you know, who asked me right. to get a hold of her, um, but I haven't been able to, and this family needs, you know, needs to move forward. So who do you know that can at least pass a note along, or can I get an email address? But... Like the question and, and find out too, are they holding probate court like, Are probate courts, family courts or those things? No, no, it's cl the, the okay. courthouse itself is closed down. Um, so right, but, are, but a lot of courthouses are closed down, but they're still holding uh, electronic court. Um, they're doing I, zoom hearings and zoom. Right. right. I don't, I think for like special circumstances, I don't think it's like, you know, a full business day where they're just zooming in and out cases. I, I don't think that's going on, but I will call to, to, to make sure. Um, that's about the best you can do. Otherwise you're just stuck. I mean, until they come back and, and hold the next, you know, cat pick up, pick up where they left off. Right. Well, the other one, the tenants, she wants it close. You know, she's ready to close. We could, but the tenants have not moved, and now they don't have to pay rent. And you know, they're saying no one is showing apartments. They can't rent anything. They can't move. Um, they were they weren't even going to rent apartments. They were going to stay with family members. So I really don't know what how to be sensitive at the situation at the same time as saving this deal but all so the conditions the condition to close have been met by the buyer yes okay and the seller, the seller has equity no it's 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 he's in foreclosure there was a reverse mortgage i mean there's some equity he'll make some money but um they were going to lose the house if they didn't sell so I would take the social leverage angle here. And I would say, you know what? The reason I'm helping this family is because I hold myself to a, a higher standard and I want to make a difference in my community. And I know you're not a business owner and you don't have to do this, but you're being selfish as hell right now. This family is not only going to lose this house, you are going to be under the thumb of a bank instead of me, someone who's been patient with you, who's been respectful to you. I'm asking you to do what you said you would do and go live with your family member. And I'm warning you that, that you're, li you're going to be living in a foreclosed house and there will be investors by here looking in your windows. As soon as this damn thing hits the records, you're going to have people looking through your windows 15 hours a day because there are a lot of people taking a position to pick up distressed assets right now. So if your privacy is a concern, if you care about doing the right thing, get your ass to your mom's house and let this person finish this and let this family move forward. And it may work. It may not. If they're good people, it should work. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. I'll definitely, those are two options uh, I need to take. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. The other, the other thing, the reason I ask for equity, I mean, you can go over there and ask for, you can offer to pay them to move, but if they, if they already verbally, if they agreed to move and they're just, they're basically just squatting there and they do have a place to live, I would never try to kick somebody out and make them homeless, but they had a plan. They made a commitment. They need to live up to that. So I wouldn't pay them um, unless, I mean, and that's your fallback. Like if the family does want to pay them to move to, to get it closed, but uh, I probably wouldn't do that if there's not that much equity to settle the estate. I wouldn't suggest it. They, they need to do the right thing. Okay. All right. I mean, it's, it's, it's awful out there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, good luck, Renee. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, and then Ronit, uh, Margie recommended, maybe you can look up the, the judge's email and phone number online. I'm guessing you, you probably already, already tried that, but certainly if you haven't, usually sometimes you can actually find their, their email address or at least their assistant. And Renee, no, the, uh, the rider, it's a sign rider. It's not a standalone sign. So that's just a rider that goes on my typical for sale, you know, real estate for sale signs. And I have them, I have some from the invest for my, like I use professional real estate signs, even for my investment company, um, which realtors hate because it looks very professional and like it's a, a listing that's not an MLS, uh, but it gets buyer calls. Okay, well guys, we have exhausted our queue for now. So I'm gonna wrap up. Um, this has been episode nine of Shift Happens, another freestyle episode. Hopefully these are valuable to you. A little bit different than what we've been doing, but we will pick up where we left off on Wednesday. We're gonna look at the sell side of your business. Um, and we do this, the way we did this on the buy side is we look at the escrow pipeline and prospecting. So the three stages of that, of that business. And we also look at it from specifically from an investor standpoint, and then specifically from a brokerage standpoint. And we kind of blend all that together because we, we haven't, we know we have a mixed audience, a mixed skill set in our audience. And also we, if you don't have that mixed skill set, we want you to have that. So if you haven't watched that, uh, if you are have deals in the pipeline on the buy side, or you want deals in the pipeline on the buy side, go back and find episode eight. And if you want to learn about the sell side, show up on Wednesday at 12 o'clock Eastern, and we'll look at the sell side. Thank you guys so much for being here, being part of Shift Happens, and uh, we'll see you on Wednesday. Thanks, Joyce.